I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. Today on our show, we're going to address the elephant in the room extreme horror movies. Now, these are the movies that politicians and watchdog groups and social activists bring up in debates about the moral depravity of society, especially around entertainment and especially around the horror film as entertainment. Now, extreme horror movies are notorious, scandalous, and sometimes have little to no socially redeeming value. And yet, some of these movies use obscenity and violence and vulgarity to create something truly horrible, beautiful for those who dare to watch. And with me today to talk about some of the best extreme horror films is the creative force behind the film Hole in the Wall and the creative force behind the Astro Radio Z podcast, Derek Carey. Derek, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Scott. So my first question to you uh, is about being a lifelong movie lover. I think at one point when we were talking on Instant Message, you had said something really interesting to me, which was, I have always been a lover of film and I will always be a lover of film. And knowing your show, uh, how you do exploitation and horror films, obviously a lifelong horror fan as well. So tell me about your first kiss. Now, that would be the movie that freaked you out and made you a horror fan. I don't know if necessarily the first film that I was exposed to freaked me out, but uh, my dad, back in, when I was a little kid, was a huge fan of Universal horror films, mm-hmm. and he exposed me to all the classics, Todd Browning's Dracula and Frankenstein and Creature of the Black Lagoon and all of these things, and there was something about uh, the gothic romanticism of Todd Browning's Dracula and the way that that movie said so much with so little dialogue that captured my imagination. And from that point, I basically became a monster kid. I wanted to gobble up every single last bit of monster slash horror media that I could. I mean, I was that dude or that kid, I should say, that when we'd go on trips, I always had Stephen King's Night Shift with me. Mm -hmm. I read that thing cover to cover. Um, His book, Dan's Macabre, which was kind of his uh, musings on the horror genre in film and all this stuff. Every single last movie that he referenced in that book, I wanted to seek out. Um, I think the first film that actually freaked me out when I was younger was probably Pet Cemetery. Mm. Um, I went and saw that movie, uh, surprisingly enough, for a friend of mine's birthday. His mom took us to go see uh, Pet Cemetery. I don't recall how old I was at that point, but that movie scarred me for years. <laughs> I, I could not look at going walking into a room. I hoped that there wasn't a disfigured uh, woman in that room <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> or or look at uh, any cemetery um in hopes that things would come back to to eat me or to get me i mean pet cemetery and night of the living dead were the two movies that changed horror from a monster kind of you know kitty fascination to something that was a little darker in something that affected me more. I think a lot of people of a certain age or older uh, have Dance Macabre as kind of like the Bible for horror films. When you first, if you're a reader, especially as a kid, that's the book that kind of gave me so many different branches to go off of and really kind of expanded what horror could be. And some of the ways that I actually believe about films comes from Stephen King. Were you a reference book kid as well? Were you the kind of kid that would grab reference reference books and said, all right, we're going to find out every horror film. This encyclopedia is going to tell me everything. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I lived uh, until I was around 11 years old. I lived in the southern uh, suburbs of Chicago. So I had access to a lot of things. But then once I turned 11, my family moved to the sticks of Wisconsin Mm. and I had very little access uh, to 
general the the general media that most people did because i mean we, we're talking a, a town of maybe 1200 people so my way of getting access to horror films which i was desperately looking for i mean i walked into video stores and i would sit in the horror section and just look at covers endlessly but it was the library so i would go and get those reference books and I would sit and look at and read all of the plot synopsis for <laughs> all of these movies, along with, um, you know, you have your gore zones, you have your cinema fantastiques, you have your fangorias, you have all that stuff. I mean, that's how I was brought into the world of underground horror, which has been a passion of mine from a very, very early age. The main big horror films that a lot of people talk about, yeah, I like those too. But there's something about horror films that dig a little deeper and do things that are a little more uncomfortable that has always struck home with me a little bit more and touched me a little bit more. And I don't mean touch me in a, a inappropriate <laughs> way. Right, right. Well, some of the dirtiest things happen in your mind, that's for sure. I, I will say that I think that a lot of times people who are cineasts, people who just love cinema and run from one genre to another, go into foreign films, they just can't get enough, tend to be that way with horror as well. And uh, yes, there's always the big films, but it is trying to find that one that just touches you in a different way or affects you in a different way, or you can at least brag about seeing that nobody else has ever seen before. So let's talk a little bit about extreme cinema because your anthology film, Hole in the Wall, is kind of a love letter to exploitation. And I think you mentioned art house horror when we talked. So what's a good example of art house horror for people? When I think of art house horror, my mind immediately goes to begotten. Let's break that down without getting too pompous about it. Art house horror, to me, um, if if I were to try and put a descriptor or like try and concoct some sort of definition for what that is, is um, mostly a film that isn't necessarily telling a linear plot, but is using the medium of cinema to convey metaphor and feeling through images and 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 montage and um, begotten to me and maybe some of the earlier silent films mm -hmm. of of Clive Barker that got put out there later after Hellraiser had come out and all that stuff. I believe Redemption Cinema had put out right. some of his early silent black and white films, which are almost fetishistic. They and and. Funny enough, because we had talked about this off air, films of Jodorowsky, you know, films that are attempting to get a deeper meaning uh, out of the themes that they are presenting through what inherently makes cinema important. It is the visual and audio uh, marriage in how that experiences triggers things in your mind. So it's always art house horror is like, an art house film that is that is more concerned with presenting horrific images. So, you know, as horror fans, we voluntarily swim in some pretty dark waters. And I guess we're going to talk about some really, really dark waters today. What do you think is the appeal of extreme horror films for you? You mentioned searching them out. Why? I think initially maybe it was because they garner a gut reaction out of the viewer, I think at the at the time when I first started watching uh, what would be made, labeled maybe as gore hound films or extreme horror films, it was the gut reaction that it gave me. The, the feeling that, one, I was watching something that I shouldn't be watching. I mean, at an early age, obviously, I was trying to consume as much horror media as I could. But there was something about seeing something that I wasn't supposed to when I was younger, right. that I think every single person that's a horror fan at some point has kind of tempted with, is kind of tempted with, is is seeing maybe pushing your boundaries a little bit. And I think the most most casual horror fans will find nothing worthwhile about these kind of films because they do push uh, the visual and emotional buttons to the breaking point. 
And there was something about maybe it was the environment that I was raised in. Maybe it was uh, just my general morbid curiosity. But I was always gravitating towards something a little darker Mm -hmm. than most horror films presented. I'm just not a casual horror fan. Like, not not to go down this route too far... But let's just take, for example, the um, ad- the new adaptation of It just came out this week mm-hmm. as we're recording this this weekend. And I, I'm really excited that most people are finding that film to be really fun and they really like it. But to me, that that screams a very surface level horror experience. And I am always a person that is gravitated towards something that is looking for something a little bit more because horror to me makes you feel it. It digs at something that is primal and that is rooted in your psyche. And that's the kind of horror that when I'm thinking of what is a horror film, it's something that affects me on a basic primal emotional level, something that I can connect with and extreme horror for better or worse, does that almost better than (laughs) most of the other films. I love a good subtle horror film, but some of these movies that we're going to be talking about today smack you across the face and linger in your brain. And that, to me, garners more weight than a, a superficial movie about and I'm not I don't want to sit and point fingers or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> this is just my own taste than a movie about a scary uh, a, a scary clown that just doesn't do anything for me. I'm, I guess I'm looking for something a little bit more. I'm interested in how when they're done well. And that's a big word to say, and <laughs> done well. Uh, I get conf- That's a key. That's a big key to these guys. Yeah, movies. because there's so many that are just absolutely horrible. But when they're done very well, and dare I say with intelligence, uh, I get real conflicting emotions. In other words, there are times when I'm watching a horror film that it is very obvious where my allegiances are supposed to go or where my feelings are supposed to be. It's standard scares. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love that too. I was just listening to a podcast. They're talking about Lucio Fulci and how they appreciated Lucio Fulci more than some of the types of films that we're talking about because there's always a level of silliness or a level of fantasy to it or the effects don't look that great or there's something that'll make you laugh out loud. And there's something to be said for that. Obviously, I watched those as well, but there's also something to be said about getting the monster fed something that is really uh, harsh and focusing. And I think it's interesting that a lot of these movies that we're going to talk about have had really, really vocal detractors. Uh, A lot of hatred has come out for these movies by doing what horror films are supposed to do, which is really disturb you. If you're the kind of person who watches horror films all the time and the average horror film is kind of like not even watching a horror film at all, it's like a nice walk in the park, you may wish to get Uh, a jolt like that. And sometimes movies that are done well are attacked more than movies that are not done well because they are effective. And I think that uh, we will see some of that happening in these movies. I mean, 95% of extreme horror films are unimaginative and and just sadistic for sadism's sake. So uh, I don't apologize for the films that we're going to talk about. Uh, I don't apologize for those other films either. Uh, But this episode is about the 5% that give me those contradictory films. And as nasty as the films are that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about five films. They really kind of stand out from the subgenres that they either exist in or in some cases the movies that we're going to talk about helped create a really regrettable <laughs> subgenre of horror and uh, you know some of these movies are also the only films that I like from that director you know it's the one moment that they kind of transcended whatever uh, the trappings may be considered uh, of that subgenre that they're involved in uh, They're going to show terrible things, these movies that we're going to talk about. And the funny thing is, you'll see these terrible things in other films, even mainstream films, but they don't do it like these movies do. As weird as it may sound, these movies show some of this stuff in a way that has no titillation whatsoever. These movies have some ultra-realistic stuff. 
some of them are, I guess you could call surreal. Uh, and sometimes if you really look closely, uh, some of them are nasty social satires as well. And they, the thing that I think, and we'll see if you agree with this, the thing about the five movies that we have picked, no matter what their style is or what the, the shock value is of them, they have one thing very much in common. Your empathy is always on the side of the victims. You know, I, and I think that that's something that is really interesting. A lot of the movies that aren't successful, uh, the 95%, I think have a lack of imagination or a lack of understanding of what the empathy of the audience is. What are your thoughts on that? It's interesting because I can think of at least one of the films where it's arguable who the victims really are. Mm, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know exactly yep. what that film is without spoiling <laughs> what the movies are we're going to be talking about. But I'm always far more interested in films that challenge me as to, like, my preconceived notions of where my morality lines lie. Mm-hmm. And I think that is something that's inherently a part of, of extreme horror cinema because on one hand um as i as we kind of talked about before you are kind of testing your moral boundaries you do have some sort of primal urge to satisfy something that most of normal society deems as taboo by watching an extreme horror film so uh, really good extreme horror films to me they talk about that. That is a part of their 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 fabric, their cinematic fra- uh, fabric is is questioning why are you watching this? So in, in turn, why are you watching this? Where do your allegiances lie within this morally bankrupt world that you're willingly deciding to experience and be part of? Um, so from that point. I'm I'm really intrigued by what you said about, you know, about trying to empathize with victims in in weird ways. And I, I'd be interested to hear what you think about this. The victims kind of shift back and forth in a lot of these these films. And I think that's what works so well about them. What do you what do you think about that, Scott? Do, I mean, do you feel that maybe um Extreme horror films try and kind of mess with you as to like trying to get you to really think about where your center line is morally. Oh, yes, I think so. And I think uh, it doesn't even have to be a horror film. I think of movies like uh, Peck and Paw's Straw Dogs. You know, a a movie where you're going to be angry at some point in that film, and it is there to provoke you. Uh, There's uh, allegiances that switch in deliverance. You know, there's uh, who is the victim in that film is dependent upon which point of view you're watching at any given moment. They have a moral ambiguity on whether or not these guys actually do the right thing by the end. Did they kill the right people? They just kill innocent guys. And I love when that happens. And I think extreme horror films that work effectively do that. Uh, ones that I don't think are effective are ones where we are on the side of the 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 the, the killer, I guess would be the right way to say it. It's almost... I think you called it chair porn or torture porn. Chair yeah. horror. That's a term that on my podcast, Astro Radio Z, that I, I came up with a while ago because uh, there is one subset of extreme horror that it, I guess uh, neuters uh, for fans of John Waters <laughs> films would would be uh, neuter horror fans uh, would term as torture porn. I, I label it chair horror because the vast majority of those movies are nothing but people chained to, or tied up to chairs and dehumanized. And one of the films we'll be talking about kind of rides that line a little bit. But that kind of extreme horror is lazy and thoughtless and, and really is just gratuitous for the sake of it. Right. So that's not the kind of stuff I think we're going to be talking about that's interesting because that doesn't trigger anything in your mind other than a base level disgust. Right. That's the unimaginative side of it. And, you know, I don't call art things that are uh, created out there uh, 
porn. But I will say that there are movies that are out there that I feel are devoid of emotion, except for one straight line. And those are the ones that I feel are cold and calculating and not worth talking about. But I, I want to get into the movies that we were going to talk about, especially because you mentioned something really interesting, which is the uh, allegiance of who is the victim and where we're supposed to feel things changes with this movie a little bit. And it's probably the one that people most know by name. It's the most notorious or infamous because it actually was big enough or hated enough that people actually know it even exists. It's it was a video nasty in the 1980s, and it's a Cannibal Holocaust from 1980. This is a movie that, when it came out, uh, the director <laughs> found himself in front of the Italian government having to prove that his actors are alive, and it was a promotional stunt gone bad. He uh, wanted to have his actors not... St- speak to the public at all for a year. And that ended up backfiring because people thought what was happening was real that was in it. And you know, Cannibal Holocaust is one of the harder uh, edged movies uh, that came out at that time. And it still has a huge shock value to it for multiple reasons. But, you know, the Italians started the shocking documentary films with Mondo Cane, uh, Dog's Life in like 1962. They're known for churning out the shock. Once a good idea comes, they start churning out the shock pretty good. Oh, yeah. And this movie uh, popularized another Italian specialty, the cannibal, the Italian cannibal horror film. Yes, there's actually something called the Italian cannibal horror film and 99% of them just copy the worst parts of this film. But you know, this film is actually kind of a precursor to Blair Witch. It's the first found footage film. Uh, So tell me a little bit about when you first saw it. And if you want to talk a little bit about the plot. Um, The first time I saw it was many years after I was aware of it. I think as horror fans, we had seen glimpses of it in Fangoria or Gore Zone. We had seen uh, in the early days of the internet a lot of message boards discussing this film and outright saying that it was not worthy of anything, that it was just shock for shock's sake. Um, I believe I first saw it when it finally dropped on DVD um, back in the late 90s. And... The first time I saw it, obviously, I wasn't looking to it um, with any deeper meaning because, obviously, we had heard about all of the ridiculously shocking things that happen in it. So it wasn't until years later, and and funny enough, you're probably going to laugh at this, until I read an essay that uh, trauma head Lloyd Kaufman wrote about... Uh, Cannibal Holocaust until I started really thinking a little bit deeper about the central themes and what uh, Ruggiero Diodato was trying to speak towards, even though he would come out in subsequent interviews and and say that I never meant any deeper meaning other than just creating a sensationalized exploitation film. Um, But central themes about the media and how, you know, news and television are are kind of creating monsters out of things that aren't necessarily there and the people behind the camera kind of instigating and creating stories that don't exist. Um, And what I'm referring to is Cannibal Holocaust is essentially the story about a man who is asked to go into the Amazon forest to find a group of documentarian um, filmmakers who have gone lost and try to find out w- not only one, what happened to them, and uh, but two, see if the, he can recover the footage that they were commissioned in order to film. And what he does is he goes to the uh, Amazon, not only finds the tribe of Amazonians that the people were um, documenting, but he finds the footage and he brings it back, and then uh, the people that had commissioned uh, these people to make this film that they were, they they sit and they watch the footage, and what they see shocks them beyond belief. That's a really simplified way to put it, but that's essentially what uh, Cannibal Holocaust is. It's the, the footage that comes back, justifiably so, 
is gratuitously violent. There's a lot of rape that is involved, a lot of nudity and dehumanization. There's also, and this is a big thing for a lot of people, but it was also part of Italian exploitation cinema at the time due to films such as Shocking Asia or Mondo Kanye, like you had talked about before, um, is the on-screen killing of actual mm -hmm. animals. So if you aren't cool with that kind of thing, and I don't, I can't imagine anyone's really cool with that kind of thing, this might be a movie that you want to skip entirely because there are obviously scenes of turtles being completely cut wide open and dissected and then cooked and then eaten, and it's all real. This is a really <laughs> tough, tough film surface level oh, wise. Yeah. But Scott, when when you think of Cannibal Holocaust, what immediately pops into your mind? When I uh, first think about the film, I think about how unsettling the documentary slash footage is. Because when that movie did come out, uh, you know, you had this weird book ending that's in the movie. You talked about it. There's a professor, an anthropologist that has to go into the jungle because these people go out to try and find uh, these cannibals who have never been photographed before. And they're about two weeks or two months late. They're not showing up and everything. And they send this guy out. And that's a very standard horror film. Uh, it's shot in a very standard way. It looks very low budget. But once we get to the footage that's actually in the, uh, the reels, it transcends the that kind of look and becomes something that feels very realistic because it's supposed to be raw footage. So they're saying things that not supposed right. to be heard. The handheld is supposed to feel that jittery. And this movie really goes for that. Uh, the iconic image, of course, is the woman impaled uh, on a stake uh, that's like 12 feet tall. That's the picture that even if people haven't seen the movie, they've seen that image and they're like, holy cow. Uh, but yeah, the thing that usually hits me about that movie is what you talked about with the animals. I didn't want to watch it when I first heard that animals got killed. And I'd seen animals killed before. This is really, really unsettling. I mean, they go in for the close-up. They do not... Uh, shy away from watching the initial incision on some mammal that they're holding in their hands till it's dead. And that is heartbreaking. And I think it's, it's very interesting that it immediately makes you despise these people who you're supposed to be, you know, hey, what happened to them? The beginning of the movie is all about the mystery of what happened to them. You are not happy with these people once that happens. I think the... The real core concept that is going on in Cannibal Holocaust is what are we supposed to believe is actually mm -hmm. real when we watch a documentary film? And the whole idea, and, and I, I tell this to people that, that come to me and talk to me about how much they love reality TV, is the fact that most document, uh, documentaries in reality television are scripted. No matter how much you want to believe that they are objective pieces of cinema or television, there is a perspective and an angle that is uh, that the filmmakers and creators are looking to portray. No matter what ends up happening, and no matter where the story ends up going, they go out there with a preconceived notion as to what is going to happen. And in Cannibal Holocaust, they go out there with the expressed interest of capturing something that is not only going to tantalize and titillize its audience, but is going to shock its audience. Right. And when they go out there and find out that the the tribe is just living life and it and it isn't as sensationalized as they preconceived it was going to be, they then craft their own narrative. And they are the ones that end up interjecting themselves into the narrative of what that story is. And that's what's most interesting to me is that what do we really see going on behind the scenes of most quote unquote documentaries and most things that we are supposed to preconceive that are real. And that's like, to me, the core concept of what cannibal Holocaust is trying to get across is that these people are monsters. Right. right. <laughs> these people, these filmmakers are monsters out there literally trying to sell you 
the the viewer something it, which is basically almost like nowadays clickbait. Mm-hmm, right. It's like what the shocking thing you need to see it. They crafted it all of their own version. Right. That's what's interesting to me. Yeah, exactly. About. I think uh, what's funny about that is because of that that end of the film, the last 10 minutes of this movie is absolute disturbing chaos that is really frightening. It's like the acting goes up a notch. It's like everything goes up a notch when we get to the final reel, what actually happens to these documentarians, because it feels like all bets are off. It's as if this is not scripted. We've seen these guys slowly pushing things. I mean, they do terrible things like set fire to a hut that has uh, women and children in it just to get these men, these warriors to go after the other tribe and all of this stuff. We see this atrocity happening. And then in the end, when they get their they're just desserts instead of cheering it at first you might cheer it but it really goes raw and it gets very disturbing mm-hmm. very quickly and i have to say the last 10 minutes of a cannibal apocalypse i put that up with just about any horror film and it's certainly the best found footage 10 minutes i've ever seen it is gut level like you genuinely have to force yourself to watch what happens to these people because essentially what it is is a tribe just sick and tired of these interlopers and they're just like we need this to end you guys are done and then for some and this is the the quintessential what most people term as the problem the inherent problem with found footage is why are they still filming right. this is there's one person that is filming all of this awful stuff that is happening in my argument for the extreme stuff in cannibal Holocaust. And in, I, I know some people, and you might not even agree with me on this is that there are reasons for everything that's happening in the, in the course of this film. And even though we, we both agreed that the animal cruelty aspect of this film is reprehensible When that is shown, there's a reason why people reacted the way they did toward uh, Diodato Mm -hmm. after this film came out is because once you see something like that, your brain immediately triggers that you have now crossed over into reality. There is something inherently real about what you're watching. And then when you see the subsequent rapes and killings and skewerings, and decapitations and all this other crap, you think you're genuinely watching something that is real because let's just say the mise son of the of what we're seeing is shaky handheld footage, which we immediately attribute towards documentary films, which right. we immediately attribute towards reality. So that final act where we wa- where we are alongside of the professor watching this footage, we think we are seeing something real. And that's why it's so hard to sit and watch the final act of this film. And it's so, yeah, uh, the, the special effects feel right. The acting feels right. The way the camera's falling uh, down feels right. Uh, It is really a chilling piece of cinema. And you mentioned something that's going to get me to the next film, which is we felt that what we were watching was something real. And a lot of times we, as an audience in general, wish to go into the dark world but we want to make sure that you give us a lifeline of some sort that reminds us that uh, this is a film. And the movies that we're talking about have moments. I think each and every one of them has a moment where we forget for a, a moment that this is scripted. They have a power to them and an impact. And everybody got mad at Diodato. And our next director, Gaspar Noe, let's just say he had a few people who are upset with him. So our next film, uh, there's a YouTube video of the 2002 Cannes Film Festival, and it shows 25 minutes after the movie started, this mass walkout that started. Uh, When uh, there's a documentary crew or a news crew there, and uh, they're talking, people are coming out. We hear that there's arguments and there's fights that are breaking out. And one of the guys says, I hope they have enough security. And then that news crew tries to get responses to the film. And most people, they won't even look at them. 
They just keep walking, stomping. Then a man shouts out how deplorable it is and how outrageous it is to be asked to watch a woman be raped for, I think he says 20 minutes. He's a little exaggerating, but it might feel like 20 minutes, definitely. Uh, And he goes, especially in that way. So there's like a special way that's even more offensive for you to be able to watch this. And a woman walks out and she says, uh, you know, they're just making fun of us, the audience. You know, this movie is just mocking us. I'm not a masochist, so I'm not liking it. And then there's a guy who comes out and he's dizzy. You know, he's just kind of like standing there and he's like, it's not shocking. He's just like, there's nothing. We don't understand anything. It's just cameras spinning in all directions. There's nothing. There's not a single thing to to hang your hat on. It's nothing. And then another guy comes out and threatens to anally rape the director for making the film. I mean, people are having some really hardcore (laughs) thoughts about this. And the last guy goes, okay. This stuff exists, but to show it to the people, you know, that are watching, I mean, they're shocked. This is manipulation. He's using cinema to be able to hurt people. And it's the same thing. You know, we're being raped because in cinema, we identify with the characters. And I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, that uh, is happening in this movie, Irreversible. First off, that's not the only thing that happens in this movie that's really disturbing, but it is the one thing that you're going to remember. And, you know, Irreversible is part of, it's one of the most uncomfortable films I've ever watched. It's part of the, I think they call it Cinema of the Body as well as New French Extremity. And there's no mistake, it's not an accident of poor filmmaking that you're as outraged as you are. Every minute of the movie, especially the first half of it, is there to make you uncomfortable and then it goes from uncomfortable to almost guilt. Uh, but I'm going to be conservative about something here. I'm going to just say, let's say 150 rape scenes in the history of film. There's two that people are always horrified. If you talk about rape scenes, there's two that always come up. It's the deliverance one where the man is raped. And then there's irreversible where we're watching for 10 minutes, an unbroken shot. You know, it's a rape inside of an underpass tunnel. And The rest of the movie is the creation of this problem and then the response to this problem and how perception really matters. But what do you think of that? Do you think that there's something to be said about being punished for punishing the audience with not giving them any titillation whatsoever when we're talking about something like rape? That's a a heavy and and tough (laughs) question. To, to, to really like answer in a way that that doesn't just say rape is horrific and I I think in the, in the history of film and it's starting I don't know if it's necessarily starting to be um, turned on its head now but there we have lived as older gentlemen you and I in a cinematic world where most of cinema was created by men and most things that deal with sexuality are looked through with a male gaze. And by that, it means they are inherently titillating and exploitive because of a, a male perspective on what sexuality is and what what necessarily will turn a man on. And I think the films that affect you per rape sequences... Um, in such a violent way, uh, Irreversible is definitely at the top of the list. I would also argue to put in um, I Spit on Your mm, Graves right. endless rape sequence, uh, which goes on for a good first half of that entire movie. Rape shouldn't be in films glorified or sensationalized or, tan- or titillating in any way. It's a horrific soul crushing experience. I have never experienced it myself, but I think it's easy for everyone to say that it affects the people that it happens to in a way that they most of them never come back from. And irreversible, I think a, a lot of what irreversible is about is that um a lot of people in general live in a vacuum a vacuum bubble of what their perception is to what reality is and what the their personal experience is and that that personal experience is universal to everyone around them and that the decisions that they make on a day-to-day basis um, end up having causality that sometimes doesn't turn out the best. And that when we look at things in hindsight, that we can tie those things together 
And how do we move on from those things? And Irreversible, the the main thing about that movie is is that it's so front-loaded with this really disgusting, you know, content where that the we open with this sequence in which the boyfriend of uh I believe in please correct me if I'm wrong, it's Monica Bellucci, right? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Where where the boyfriend of Monica Bellucci who is in it, it, you know eventually endures this horrific rape sequence um, is out to find the person or people that did this. And he ends up going apeshit crazy and killing a bunch of people that weren't necessarily tied to this instead of, you know, trying to help (laughs) his girlfriend or his wife or whoever, you know, cope with what has happened to them and maybe realize how he fucked up in their relationship as well. The, right. This front-loaded section, in, in the whole narrative structure of Irreversible, it, it speaks to how we think about the past. We don't mm-hmm. necessarily, when we sit and reminisce about what has happened to us in our life and the things that maybe we regret about what's happened to our, us in our life, we don't think about them in a linear fashion. Irreversible is told from the end to the beginning. Right. And I think it, it, I've seen people um, attempt to do fan cuts where they put it back in order. Mm-hmm. That misses the entire point right. of the film to me. It's yeah. because we we don't experience the past in a linear fashion when we sit and reflect on it. Not only that, I think uh, what's really interesting, as you mentioned, it's, it unfolds in reverse chronological order. Uh, what we get by having it in that, and what I think is brilliant, there's only 13 scenes in this movie. In other words, there's 13 times that time goes in a chronology and then goes backwards upon itself. And each of those are set pieces that give a little bit more information about what happened. But the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie start with the same quote, time destroys all things. You know, we're talking about fate and destiny here, sure, but really we're talking about cause and effect. You mentioned before living in a bubble. Uh, the idea that our perceptions are what the reality is. This movie is kind of like being a detective on the scene, or you're fi- you're you're trying to, or a news reporter trying to find out what's going on. We have a distinct feeling and distaste for certain people in the very beginning that become tragic and sorrowful by the end because we see where their lack of information is the same as our lack of information. We're able to find out things that maybe the people who are in this tragedy never find out. It's ironic how certain things, certain justices happen to the wrong people. As you mentioned, uh, there's a a, a very, very disturbing murder in the beginning of the film with a a fire extinguisher that is really, uh, that was, my God, I can't believe that this movie made me feel so horrible about this long, prolonged, disturbing death. Really watching someone not only shattered physically, but seeing them go to animal survival and confusion and stupefaction while dying, it's really, really gut-wrenching. And we get that kind of thing through this. But what we're getting as we're moving backwards through time is we're seeing what life was like before that incident, that 10-minute incident, and how there were still problems. But it's so sad to see misread signs, secrets that are never given from one character to another. Uh, things that might be considered gifts later are now going to be tragic by uh, the end slash beginning of the film. It's a brilliant look at taking uh, not only time, as you mentioned, as a, a memory game that we see in a nonlinear fashion, but also uh, kind of a, a hit on what our expectations are as an audience and how quickly we run to fill in the blanks. And by doing that, we're wrong constantly through this film. And it makes our investment bigger, if you can make it through, you know, the, the, uh, whatever he has like a weird 60 cycle hum that's on the soundtrack for the first yeah. half of the movie that actually induces <laughs> nausea in some people. If you can endure all of that, you get to this piece that is so fragile and tragic, uh, that the end of the movie is weirdly 
exhilarating and sad at the same time. I'm trying to think of something that's close to that. It's kind of like the very last shots of Pasolini's Sallow, where these guys are dancing as the world is basically burning. And right. there's this horror to that and this sorrow to it. And uh, that makes this movie just so devastating to me. But it's also very visually strong. Uh, what do you think is uh, the, the moment in the film where you went, oh my God, this isn't just crap or an endurance test this is something more uh it is that final scene i think that final scene is so melancholy in its beauty and because of the information that we we do have from the first half of the film it's it, kind of like when you look back at let's say uh a dissolved relationship that you felt a very strong emotional connection to that is no more and you look back at the times in which it worked. And then you, because you already have the information as to what dissolved that relationship and in in maybe the bad things that had happened on your side or on the other person's side, you those feelings of those times that were good are now tinged and have a, a, a different meaning to them in that final sequence where it's almost kind of that postcard level um you know newlywed period mm -hmm. of a relationship it is heartbreaking because you know eventually this is going to self-destruct yeah and i think gasper no way all of his films at some point discuss the the weird insular um, lives and bubbles that we all live in and how really destructive that can be if you don't have a sense of the surroundings around you. I think his first film, I Stand Alone, um, really speaks to that. And that's also another film that that uh, content wise is really tough to watch. I think everything I have yet to see love. That's something that <laughs> I've been meaning to because I actually really like all of his films because I think he is not only a visual stylist, because his movies are just so creative and inventive visually, he's always trying to push the boundaries of what um, maybe the respective genres that he's tackling are. But mm -hmm. he just wants to push things from a, a technical standpoint to their limit, not only um, visually, but also content wise. And his movies are just never about the shallow superficial things that most people get upset about. There's so much more going on underneath them in that final sequence of irreversible. I mean, the whole, t the title of the film kind right. of speaks to the entire point of the movie is that all of our decisions cannot be changed. Right. So it's important for us to think about the bigger picture every step of our lives. Yeah. It's brilliant as well, in my view, because it has a certain level of pure cinema to it. The beginning of the movie, we are in, ensconced in a world of that one emotion. It's the emotion of rage. It's the emotion of vengeance. We are just going down this hell. And at the end, it's a completely different emotion and the, the, the visuals are completely different. It's expressionistic in its way. And I, I kind of look at the very beginning of Irreversible. It's kind of like the world that Don Siegel had to create in the original Dirty Harry to be in a spot where Dirty Harry's actions could be justified. It literally had to be a world where firemen can't even figure out how to bring a guy down that's trying to commit suicide. Harry has to get in the, the thing and go up right. and talk the guy down. Nothing can or work. Or like Death Wish. Or yes, like, you know, exactly. Chuck Bronson and Death Wish. Yeah. And here in this movie, we have the most depraved and perverse gay SM bar ever called The Rectum. I mean, everything about this movie, the world has to be so dark for this rage to work. And that is where it's so expressionistic to me. The very beginning of the movie, it's oranges and reds and shadows and, you know, a brutality that's happening. And towards the end, it's so softening. 
And yeah. it's it's just an amazing piece if you can survive it. And that's the thing. And people walked out at minute 25. Uh, they saw the hardest part, that expressionistic welcome to that rage, welcome to that vengeance. And they had no idea that there was going to be something at the other end. I do not uh, hold that against anybody after you watch the movie because it took a lot for me to watch this again. Yeah, it's it's not an easy movie. I think... You know, upon revisiting it for this show, um, I had only ever watched it once before, and that's when it initially first came out on DVD. I had bought it, and uh, because I was a big Gaspar Noé fan um, from his first movie, and it's one of those movies where I think you to you you should at least experience it once. Mm-hmm. I think if if you're a uh, you have a stronger constitution. And you do like films that explore certain sides to the human condition a little that are a little bit tougher to stomach <laughs> to come to a bigger truth. This is a, an amazing movie. And I, I love the fact that you talked about the color scheme because that first half, I mean, on a purely primal level, we associate anger with red mm-hmm. and with hues of red. And the beginning or, or the end of the film, we have whites and blues, which we, ex- we which we associate with tranquility, in in feelings of safety. And how anybody could sit and look at this film and call it just straight exploitation and, and straight shock for shock's sake? They are turning that part of their brain off. That allows them to to really sit and dig into the larger truths of what this filmmaker is trying to express. Right. And the thing with Irreversible, if you are a uh, film lover, yes, there's a, a patina of real filth and grime to this film, but there's also a very artful feel to it if you really love camera work and stuff. Now, we're going to go to the next film where we don't have that. We don't have the, the facade of excellent camera work and amazing colors and things. This is stripped down bare, uh, disturbing, closest probably to chair horror uh, as we get in this, perhaps, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but what we are about to talk about is a movie that was shot on video. You know, usually that's anathema for film snobs. Uh, And it's a movie that was made with a a limited budget. And there's only really two main characters in it. And there's only, I think, three different sets that are in the entire film. And yet, it's almost like upping the ante of what we're talking about with extreme horror. Is that we're, okay, we had uh, the artistic side of Irreversible. We're about to see something that doesn't allow for that artfulness in visuals and yet i think that this movie really attains a level of art that is thoroughly unexpected i was thoroughly blown away when i saw it and i had forgotten about it until i listened to your amazing uh deconstruction of this movie on astro radio z and it is eric stanzi's scrapbook from 2000 it's a tough one yeah <laughs> No doubt. I mean, the tagline is true horror is simply what one human being can do to another, right? Now, that's super exploitive. Any movie could say that, but it's also really deceptive because we immediately go to the physical when we hear that one human being can do to the other. But this is more about the irrevocable damage that's done to the mind. You know, this is loss of self or the struggle to not lose self. And right. I almost want to just sit back and let you go on the amazing soliloquy that you had about this movie. <laughs> oh, boy. Way to build up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I this. Well, I think um, this movie's kind of like memory, cause, and effect, just like Irreversible in a way. Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, for, for the listeners who aren't familiar with what Scrapbook is, it's essentially the story of um, a serial killer who kidnaps... Um, a woman and takes her back to his kill shack and then proceeds to tell her that she is his final victim for what is his masterwork, which is the scrapbook he's been putting together of all of the people that he's been torturing and killing and that she is the final piece to the scrapbook before he lets it out into the world and gains the notoriety that he believes 
he is deserved because all his life he has been treated and humiliated horribly by not only his family but the outside world and the 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 big twist about this scrapbook and about what he wants her uh, to accomplish is that she, he wants her through her own words to describe what is happening to her not only on a physical level but on a psychological level um, alongside of pictures that he's taking of her and she can see what has happened to all of these other people because not only are they in the scrapbook they are strewn all over the walls mm -hmm. and this house that she that he has taken her to literally is so grimy and filthy due to the fact that he has not cleaned up a single shred of evidence of all of the debaucherous and disgusting things that he has done to all the people that are in this scrapbook. Now, the film itself really does wallow in uh, depravity for the most part. But what's interesting about it, and I, I know... Most people that would watch it probably wouldn't agree with me, and I think why you and I connected on this, Scott, is that from a filmmaker's standpoint, there's a little something more going on here than just a straight shriek show, yes. than just a, like a shock for shock sh uh, sake film. Um, let's just break out of the content of this film and look at it for what it is. You had mentioned that it was a shot on video film. Now, for those people that grew up in the 80s, mm -hmm. what did you attribute at that point? And, and this kind of ties into a little bit of what we had discussed about with Cannibal Holocaust towards when you watched something, what did you think was real? <laughs> if, ever, if there was anything that you, you could watch that your brain immediately triggered towards as reality... What was it? It was things that were shot on VHS yep. and shot on video because every last person that I knew or at that time, we had switched over from eight millimeter film, which were home videos to a lot of people for a long time to VHS camcorders. So that look inherently changes your mind as in perception as to what you're watching as being something that is inherently real. And the entire look of this film has that look to where, could this be a snuff film? Could this be something that was just found? Obviously isn't. It's presented right. in almost a way that, that could arguably be said to be a, a kind of like a filmed play. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because there's only really like two or three different characters the entire time. And there's only two or three different sets, as you had alluded to before. Um, but there's just something that immediately triggers a, a psychological uh, perception as to what you're watching due to the, the film stock that it's shot on, which is not film. It's obvious. It's digital video. And, and then how it's presented, which is in a, a very like one take kind of way. Um, Eric Stanze, who's the director of this film, um, would go on to, to say in subsequent interviews after he had made this movie that a lot of what was done was done in a very um, method kind of way where these actors, he had given them cues. They had talked about what they were going to do uh, before they shot it, and then he would just roll and let the film roll for long periods of time. And because of this, because of all of these things that I've kind of described as to, I guess, the maze song of what this film is, is all of these subsequent decisions go into making the viewer who's experiencing this feel like they're a fly on the wall accomplice yeah. as to what's going on in this. But when we dig a little bit deeper, we start to see that through the character's actions and what ends up happening in the film, there's something being spoke to that's not necessarily implicit in any of the dialogue or in any of the actions towards how people treat each other. Yes. And I think the, the tagline of the film, which you had said before, speaks towards the underlying message of this movie 
more than anything that's shown. I mean, it, it is the culmination of this experience and uh, this idea of a memento that we all keep um, some sort of, now it's Facebook, where that is essentially the new age scrapbook. Right. And um, this guy is keeping this scrapbook to get some sort of um, notoriety or fame. This guy, I mean, it, it speaks to like how everyone now wants so, uh, the constant justification for their existence on Facebook via likes and comments right. and things like this. He wants that through, I mean, he's done horrible, extremely terrible things. And it's all documented in this. Yet for some reason, he feels that people are going to love him for this. It's narcissism. It speaks to extreme narcissism. And unfortunately, because of, um, and, and we're going to keep saying this because I think a lot of really good extreme horror tries to delve into the psyche of what is inherently a problem with humans is is narcissism, is this idea that we will do anything in not to just ourselves, but to the those around us in order to feel like our life has worked. Yeah, I mean, uh, and this is something that I, uh, when you mentioned that this is a movie that has that realism to it because it's a shot on video, digital video film, I don't want to give people the idea that this also feels just like a whole movie. Stanze does some really interesting directing here. Uh, and there's a reason that he's still out there working camera for other people and putting his own films together because there is a very much fly on the wall feel and then it moves away into different comment in where he puts the camera. The idea that you mentioned the place is not cleaned up. He leaves all this stuff. That's like his internal being externalized into this nasty seedy room. He wears a, a suit that's just a little bit too big for him at certain points. And then he's just running around in his underwear. There are these visual images like I'm winning written in blood on the wall. I'm winning while he's raping her is uh, what we see. It's pathetic. It's like uh, shouting something out on Facebook. And then when she is writing in the scrapbook, she writes, he's a loser. So we have I'm winning and we have loser. And he ends up torturing her uh, because of what she wrote there. He tears it out of the book, crumples it up and throws it away. And then has to put it back in the book. He's compelled to put that back in the book. It matters to him whether he got that many likes for what he just did. It's very right. interesting. And it's also a sign of this, you know, he's a horrible person. And then there's this delicate, fragile thing in the center that may be the only reason that she survives. But there are shots in this movie where it looks like it's a fly in the wall. And then if you look back at it, you go, wow, uh, there are these long shots. And then there are these moments like when he's trying to get her into the trash can and the camera's just in the right place and allowing the grass to be in the foreground and she's rolling around. And it has this real frisson to it that feels very real and yet is very pleasant. Land. This is not just a what people might think of a trashy film where it's just, oh, well, two guys put up a camcorder. One guy went for a cigarette. The other guy raped the woman. But there is something very disturbing about this film as well that you mentioned where it's kind of method. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, Tommy Biondo wrote this, correct? He was the, the writer, right. and he used about five years of his life to look at all of these serial killers. So he's also the lead actor, along with Emily Hack. These are our two people, Clara and Leonard. There are scenes in this movie that really disturb me because it feels too real. There's a moment where uh, Leonard is forcing Clara to the ground on her knees, and he's pulled down his pants, and he's telling her to walk towards him. And there's a moment when he tells her to kiss it. And Emily Hack <laughs> looks off to the left, away from him to where I'm assuming the director is. And every time I see that, I get this real nauseous chill. It's like, how far are we on the method? How much of this is scripted? And whether that is that she's just method acting and she's not really looking at Eric it's a moment that the fourth wall kind of breaks that terrifies me. It really disturbs me more than anything else in that film. And there is some seriously disturbing stuff in it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, without going into 
you know, every last thing that happens in this movie, I think that is that is very real. And there's I mean, there's a scene of her getting pissed on. I mean, there's scenes of her getting raped with a bottle. I mean, there's just it, it just atrocious things that happen in this movie. And it's very hard to stomach and it's very hard to recommend yes. this movie. It, it really is. But it does have worth. There is something being spoke to in this film that a lot of similar films just don't have. Right. They they haven't thought about that because they're trying to get the cheap pop of all of this exploitive, dehumanizing, grotesquerie. And that's where it, when you look at a director and you see that he's made something like this. I think you, you, in order to not only justify its existence, <laughs> you you kind of have to see in context what else has he done, and what is his normal approach to films in filmmaking. In Eric Stanze, historically, always is trying to push the boundaries of what cinema is. His movies are experimental. His movies are visually very interesting and daring and dynamic and he's not necessarily just lingering on shocks for shocks sake he is a director that's interested in bigger truths in a lot of his films let's but i mean let's be honest he has made some you know exploitation for higher type stuff mm -hmm. but i i do feel that the vast majority of his work um is trying to do a little bit more than just linger on depravity. And so that that makes Scrapbook and, and the discussion of what Scrapbook is, it, it really makes me as not only a viewer, but as a, a, a film fan in general, want to dig deeper into what is going on here. And if you go and you sit and hear or read about Estanze uh, and the creation of this film, you will get the fa the hint that this isn't just about what we're seeing. There's more going on here. Right. So uh, the thing that I think is makes this different or gives us a little bit more than what these movies normally do is that there is a richness to the complexity of the characters. They're not necessarily the one note thing. We get to see Clara, Emily Hack, trying to survive this but thinking. And there are moments where she becomes an individual. She's not just this thing being attacked. She's not the perils of Pauline. She's not just a, uh, uh, a beating up tool. We, we see how she uses a level of intellect and survival to continue on in this. And he makes a fatal mistake of giving her the scrapbook to read because she gets to read all the things that didn't work. And she gets to see how everybody becomes almost like Stockholm syndrome with this guy. And she's able right. to find the chink in his armor to allow her inevitably or at the end of the movie to uh, be able to escape what i'll say uh, about this movie is it starts so strong if you want to see mood for very little money uh, the opening is in a black screen we're in a vehicle it's driving down a road and we hear two women talking in the dark and one is screaming and the other's going, oh, we're going to be okay. He really likes you. And, you know, we find out they're in the back of a van. We see our killer as he opens up the back doors and we see the two women. And there's a reveal that one of the women is horribly mutilated, gutted, and she's dying. And she's the one who's saying he really likes you. And the other one is the one that is terrified, the new one, Clara, who's there. The movie somehow survives what I consider a little bit of a misstep, which is the flashback, because I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. Necessary. It's not that it's too long. I just don't think Clara doesn't get one, but he gets one. It's almost like showing that little photo of him as a kid would have been enough because I don't think the movie really needs, it doesn't ask the questions that that flashback answers. And why I think it was tough is because you had this great mood. It's like a shark right there. That first five minutes of black and the slowly scrolling uh, credits that that kind of takes the flow of what we were in and kind of slows it down. But I think that there's something really artful about and sad and literary about 
the relationship that's happening between Clara, this very sick and damaged relationship between Clara and Leonard. And it's not like this movie is going into sordid material that nobody else has done. William Wyler in 1965 made a movie called The Collector that was off of a best-selling novel that had the essence of what this movie is talking about in it. This is much more graphic. This goes in far deeper directions than uh, Wyler would in Depravity. But at the same point, I think there is a a really rich uh, emotional piece to mine about relationships in this film. Yeah. And also you, you had made um, a comment about this earlier about uh, that, that look that Emily Hack has this performance yes. um, by Emily Hack is one of the most fearless things I've ever seen in my entire life. And um, the fact that she isn't spoken of more or given more roles yeah. to me is such a huge disservice to her abilities because the, what really makes you feel in this movie isn't the shocks. It's the performances of these two. And Eric Stanze was smart enough to not delude those performances through editorial. Right. And... The, the way that this is presented to you allows those two actors to really shine. And um, for even if the disgust, you don't want to look beneath the surface level of this movie for a shot on video exploitation film. Scrapbook has acting well beyond anything it deserves. Oh, yeah. If you want to, if you get a chance, I don't know if it's on YouTube, but as a listener, if you want to see what we're talking about, there is a monologue that happens relatively early in the film that is done by Leonard as he's talking to Clara. She's kind of forced to sit with him at this table, and he talks about the first time he kills somebody. And it is such a giveaway on his personality. There's such a wonderful, there's this power, then there's this patheticness, then there's this sorrow and this misguided sorrow when he says, nobody knows where anybody is anymore. Nobody watches each other anymore. And here's a serial killer who lives off of people not being watched, that he has this moment where he kills this girl and he waits around and nobody ever comes. And it's such a lonely line of dialogue. Nobody is coming. Nobody ever comes for her. But the dialogue that he has at that moment, it runs maybe, I think, a minute, minute and a half. You've got everything that you need to know about both of those characters. Which makes that opening sequence, the flashback, even more pointless. Right. To, to me, I, and I agree with you, and I know we discussed it at length on uh, my podcast, Astro Radio Z, the, that that sequence, the flashback, is the only point in this film that feels exploitive, that feels that it's there for titillation beyond everything else that we're going to see, which is not, which is not sensationalized, which I believe... Um, the original idea of this film was to showcase the fact that in a world where we sit and glorify and glamorize serial killers, this movie is going to show you that there is no reason we should be doing so whatsoever. Right, right. Anything else that you want to say about uh, Scrapbook before we move on? It's a hard movie to recommend, but for the more adventurous film viewer that has a strong constitution and stomach, I believe it's essential. Excellent. Now, the next film that we're going to talk about, I have no problem recommending to people, and people have no problem in telling me that I'm a monster for doing so. <laughs> but I, <laughs> That's half of the stuff I recommend and half the stuff I talk about on my podcast. Right. Uh, people who have listened to my show have heard me talk about this movie and champion it before, but I would be remiss not to bring it up and allow another viewpoint in here as well. And this is Pascal Lagier's Martyrs from 2008. Uh, he states that he was inspired by Hostel, uh, but instead of making a movie about suffering, he went and make a movie about pain, which is actually a very interesting way to say it. Uh, he confessed that he wrote the screenplay while he was in a state of clinical depression, and that might be why it's so nihilistic and depressing in subject matter. But I think that when we're talking about movies where there seems to be a lot more going on behind, uh, beneath the surface and how easy it is for people to talk about it and kind of generalize it into a category of movies that they do not like. 
I think that this movie, Martyrs, probably has that more. It's probably, I think it was called the single most divisive film to ever screen at Cannes. Uh, and it may be very true that that's what it is. It's basically a uh, example of French horror films that are extreme at this point. It would have been much easier to talk about Inside, but that kind of... Uh, that's beside the point. I mean, it, because Inside is easier and more palatable for uh, horror film lovers to watch, it makes me feel that Martyrs has something more going on inside of it. And I might not be alone uh, before I'll defend my point one more time. With uh, I think Time Out magazine had a, uh, a poll with authors and directors, actors and critics who worked within the horror genre for the last 50 years to vote for their top horror films. Martyrs was number 30 one out of the last 50 years. What are your thoughts on Martyrs? Martyrs is another one of those films like Irreversible that I've watched once and I never had the feeling to watch it again. <laughs> Not because it was bad, because but because it affected me so well. Um, when you talk about the new, uh, the French new extremity and, and you know, the, the 2000s and the movies that came out of it from Alexander Aja with with switchblade romance slash hot tension. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk about frontiers and in inside, which I, this is probably going to be the most divisive thing said on this podcast. I feel is one of the most overhyped films (laughs) of the last 20 years. Um, When you think of those films, a lot of it works on a very surface level. All of those movies have very constrictive uh, modes of, communication within them they all are slightly based on something that's come before and martyrs feels like something like i've never seen before it the way that it's told is fragmented the way that it's presented is visceral and in your face and uh just yanks at you immediately and the fact that you have hey you you sit through this and at the same time, there are glimpses of something a little deeper that's going on under its surface thematically. I, it it really kicked me in the nuts <laughs> <laughs> the first time I watched it, and not in a bad way. I absolutely love this yeah. movie. I, I think as not only just a, a horror fan or an extreme horror fan, when a movie, and this isn't, explicitly stated anywhere within the film when a film tries to turn its eye onto the viewer in in point right at them and ask them what is it about this that is interesting to Mm -hmm. you that's when i start becoming very excited about a film because i i think beyond all of the religious and philosophical and existential Um, things that are presented within Martyrs. The biggest thing I took away from it was its dissection on what was termed at that time. And it's funny that he went on to say that Hostel was a huge influence and why he wrote this was what is so tantalizing about quote unquote torture porn? And why do we watch this? And what is the bigger truth that's being spoken to? in the human condition as to why we would subject ourselves to this kind of entertainment. And that's what I walk away from more out of anything that's presented in here in Martyrs is that question as to why am I so interested in having an experience like this? I found myself, as you mentioned, it was like a kick in the nuts. It certainly was. I found myself weirdly (laughs) exhilarated by getting kicked in the nuts by this film. When I saw it as a film viewer, especially as a horror viewer, taken without any of the subtext that I may see in it, the idea of the acts of surprise that this film gave me was just Mm -hmm. amazing. It's such a switching film. It's constantly changing. And the very opening of it is so gripping. We just have this young girl who's obviously just escaped from some form of captivity. We don't know what, but she's running alone, screaming, uh, dirty and wounded 
before we even get into what the film's all about, before the title even comes up, we're getting this abstract image. And the movie is going to come back to that image multiple, multiple times on different levels. But we're already in a story, and then that story changes. And it changes three times, <laughs> three major changes yep. that happen in this film. Each one its own little movie in and of itself about whatever that subject might have been. You know, we have perhaps a, a monster that is her id, that is uh, the, the self-abuse that someone who survived abuse has, and there's that moment. But we have this strange situation where we jump ahead in time and they don't tell us. And we're watching this happy uh, family on a farm in France, uh, basically having one of the better conversations that you'll hear uh, movie families have, more realistic than normal. And then there's a knock on the door, and the door is opened, and there's a shotgun that blows the father across the room, and we're in the midst of a massacre, and then we see that it is a girl. And then we find out that it is the girl that we saw in the very opening of the of the film. And it becomes a invade home invasion film and then it becomes a little weirdly supernatural and then it becomes this thing about a tortured friendship and then it has a turn on who is the main character and then things that seem as if they are you know imagination uh, moments for someone who is mentally ill it seems maybe there's reality to that and that was a a mind blower for me when I was watching it. I was going, thank you for knowing enough about cinema language to surprise me with this instead of confuse me with it. All the little pieces of that are in that film before those crazy shifts happen, but they're hidden very well. And it's a very bloody film. It is far from yeah. uh, 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 overhyped as grotesque. Uh, it is a very grotesque film. But it does have emotion to it that is not normally seen in these films. When I think of torture porn, I think of where we're once again on that one emotion that's constantly going, and they're telling us how we're supposed to feel. And it's basically self-gratifying. They know the audience. They're going to play to the audience. And I loved being surprised by where martyrs went. And then everything else is kind of icing on that that makes me feel that we are on to a very interesting storytelling style that I would say you would see in something like Peck and Paw, where you will take that ugliness to get to a deeper truth. Yeah, and it's unfortunate, at least for me, that um, his subsequent film that he made, The Tall Man, tries to replicate this style almost like exactly again, and it just doesn't right. work at all. And where Martyrs, it has, it is such, you know, it's, you're probably going to laugh that I'm going to say this. It is such a beautiful film to look oh, at. Oh, yes. From, a, uh, from just a photography standpoint. Yes. Uh, cinematography is gorgeous. The editorial is tight and, and effective. Um, the shocks come and they work so well because of misdirection. Yes. Because of uh, somebody who is an expert at the language of cinema and how it works in moving the viewer into certain states of mind in order f to allow impact to happen and have it be meaningful. And I think that's why this movie, even more than the content, affects people is because they slowly but surely in each of these subsequent little vignettes that you go through through this film, you feel something for the people that are being mm -hmm. presented. Yes. And then the rug gets pulled out completely underneath you and you go in different directions. Yeah. Um, this movie is just, it's awesome. It's, it's reprehensible <laughs> from, <laughs> right. from, from like in a lot of ways from a surface level, kind of like gore, it, uh, just how visceral it is. But it is such an expertly made film that it is shocking to me that people allow themselves to let the knee-jerk reaction of uh, just what they're seeing pull them out of this movie. I mean, mm -hmm. were were you invested in this movie right away because it's just like so cinematic? Oh, yes. Uh, that opening shot, as far as I'm concerned, that is great pure cinema. And it even the... Uh 
the subsequent shots that they have, which are supposed to be home movies of how she's going into this uh, this children's home and people are continuing to try and ask her questions and he doesn't want to talk. You are empathizing without a word being said by this girl. You're, you, you are thoroughly invested in her. And where the movie goes, it really hits you in the gut because you've invested so much in this one soul person, then you have this, this friendship. But the visual images, the language of film is so spectacularly well done in this, and pacing is so smart in this film, mm-hmm. and the uh, complexity of emotions. And that's one of the reasons that The Tall Man really bothered me. I think I mentioned early on that there are some movies where it's the only movie that I like of the directors, and this would be. Martyrs is like a, a grand slam home run, and then, you know, that's it. Uh, it. There wasn't much for me after that. And sorry, Pascal, if you're listening, which you're probably not. But, of course he is. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course he is. is. <laughs> of course. He's like, what? Martyrs is being talked about. Come on, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Build a little but uh, yeah, that whole uh, thing of the complexity of the emotions. I think why people look at this as torture porn isn't the violence, uh, although there's plenty of it. It's oh, yeah. the way that you feel about the violence. There's a very, and I don't want to get into too much of it, but there's a very much a religious imagery that's going on inside of this film. When they find uh, someone who's been tortured for a while, who's has n- not seen light and has no hair and is emaciated, there's this whole almost beatific washing of the body. And this whimpering and weeping. We are not hearing screams of pain, which are the high up to 11 volume that you normally hear in a torture porn film. We are getting sorrow. And there is many moments of sorrow. There is a repetition that could be seen like the Stations of the Cross when she's getting beaten. One of the characters is getting beaten. uh, She's been trapped by these people. She's living the nightmare of the nightmare that she heard about all that time. I can't think of much more terrifying than that. Like being brought up, hearing about the terrible tortures of this one guy. And then this one guy comes and gets you and takes you to the torture chamber. The psychic nightmare that that must be is incredible. But we start to feel through repetition of the violence that's happening to this person, it almost becomes, I wouldn't say intimate, but there is this transfer of complex emotions that we start feeling between jailer and victim because he's doing these horrible things and then there are these moments where he is holding her as if she is a, a, a sacred object. And that's well, very... Well, because he is to Yes. To them. Yeah, the, the captors. She is a sacred object. Right. I mean, not to give away too much to uh, the listeners if they haven't seen Martyrs, which I completely urge them to to go and check out. Um, the whole idea is that the, these captors are are trying to through these tortures and through depravity and through um, holding these people and uh, and disconnecting them from the outside world, trying to get them to a state of um, near death that they witness the beyond and that they give them the ultimate truth as to what is happening after life. And through through that, <laughs> oh, it, yeah. this is something where, <laughs> you know, when we talked about um, the his subsequent film and why it just didn't work, they unfortunately remade this film recently. Oh, man. And... And what I thought just didn't work about it was the fact that it felt like that core feeling of putting the audience through the ringer for a reason as opposed to being a plot device right. was missed. And the, the the way the acting is in this movie, um, how visceral it is in this movie – it, it, it is intrinsic to why this movie works and the tall man and the martyrs remake just misses it entirely because of its presentation, because of the acting, because of the decisions that are made to over explain what is going on, to not present these people as complex beings, but to put them in just really superficial one note caricatures of archetypes that we know and that we can grasp from being lifelong film watchers of the Hollywood sort. 
um, it simplifies it to the point where it just isn't effective. And it, you just feel like you're just watching this really superficial level horror film that you're just supposed to react to based on, well, this is really messed up, isn't it? As opposed to really getting to the core of, you know, there is different shades of things that are going on with each of these characters, not only just the people that are being tortured, but the torturers and what their ultimate goal is. And then that final scene yeah. in Martyrs, in the new, and in the original, not the new one. They, right. The new one completely fucking misses the mark. <laughs> yes. But uh, that, just that final sequence in uh, spoilers, right. <laughs> put that yeah. out there, because I think <laughs> to talk about this, it's, it's, really important to to say that that final nihilistic moment where our character all these people are shrouding around her because they know it's the point where of no return where she's about to see the light and she's about to die and finally glimpse what it is and she goes it's fucking nothing right it's so devastating keep doubting keep doubting it's nothing it, that's when I will go back to what I had said before about how we as horror viewers and how we as extreme horror viewers that are looking for something more always question everything. The Socratical, the, mm-hmm. always be questioning what it is uh, that you are experiencing, what it is that you hold dear and the truths that you feel are self-evident. Always be questioning that stuff. And that maybe you aren't right at all. (laughs) Right. Nothing is right that you know. (laughs) And it's just like, it's profound and it's amazing that it just like to see that remake and that it had, oh God, I fucking hated that remake. Yeah. Oh, it makes me so upset. (laughs) The only thing that I like about the remake is that it proves my point about the original, which is it had to be. As it was like people will go, well, did it have to be so why did the violence have to go so long in that one sequence? Why was it so I don't think the movie would effectively work if it wasn't as extreme as well as having the flourishes that make it so memorable and above a normal extreme film. The uh, themes, the visual sense, the acting, the pacing, the imagination of what's going on, all make this one of, to me, one of the best extremist, extreme horror films that I've ever seen. And that brings me to possibly one of the best extreme horror films I've ever seen of recent, <laughs> <laughs> which is... Got to be redundant. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a true gut punch of a movie. And whereas you have uh, Martyrs that uh, works on some heady things, this is more... A, a movie that comes right to the gut comes from things that you could feel and sense without having to have had extreme experiences in your life. This is a movie that has so much going on inside of it on what happens in family dynamic dynamics, uh, the love of uh, family members and brothers and what happens when there is illness that you don't want to really take a look at. And this is 2012's Found by Scott Shermer, one of the biggest surprises I've ever had in my life. I didn't expect anything from this film. I heard about it at a convention where Scott Shermer and the group were sitting around selling their their Blu-rays, and I heard about an $8,000 movie. And when I heard an $8,000 movie, half of me goes, oh boy, this could be good, and half of me remembers how many $8,000 movies I've watched that I just couldn't stand. And this <laughs> completely blows that out of the water. I cannot, this is like a miracle, this film. For $8,000, I would think that the makeup budget was $8,000. I would have thought that the catering budget would have been $8,000. I would have thought the amount of money that it costs to do color correction would have been $8,000. To think that this movie is as strong technically and acted as decently, it's not 100% well acted, but there are strong central characters in there that are acted so phenomenally I can't believe how good this film is for something that 
very few people know about. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who's been involved with uh, the underground horror film scene or just uh, filmmaking in general, as I am a, by trade, I'm a film editor and video editor. Um, I know what it takes in order to make a film from that standpoint of not having any budget to work with and having to try and craft something that not only is just plain watchable, but that is effective and affects the viewer. Um, Because every last thing that you see on screen and behind the screen costs money. A lot of low-budget filmmakers have to kind of depend on the kindness of people. Right. They have to depend on uh, people donating not only their time, but maybe their houses, maybe transportation, maybe making food, which is such a huge part of filmmaking. Right. It's making <laughs> sure that everyone eats. Um, so every last thing that isn't donated to you costs money. The cameras, the gear, um, the time of good crew, um, good actors, which is why found is so it, it's divisive amongst people, I think, that are maybe casual film fans because it has that shot on video quality and the actors are mostly non actors. I think a lot of people may disconnect from that level with it, but it's it's unfortunate because this is what I would term as, you know, it, from, as a fan of shot on video horror of like the late 80s, early 90s, these movies that we would, you know, have bait and switched into renting back right. in the day because the covers were so attractive <laughs> that we took them home and we're like, oh, shit, this looks like a backyard, <laughs> like my right. home video or a grandma shot. Um, I because I rented so many of those things, I started growing a taste for them and I'm able to look beyond those shortcomings and budgets of a lot of films more than most people that I know. And is this a good thing? Some people think that it's a really bad thing <laughs> <laughs> because I watch a lot of garbage <laughs> per their, their opinions, but um, found really takes these shortcomings and pushes beyond them because at the core of the movie is an amazing script. Yes. Um, there's, there's a great multi-layered story that's being told here. And the, the filmmaking aspects, um, the technical aspects are good enough that the story is able to shine through more than perhaps maybe the spotty um, acting. Right, right. And maybe sometimes the shortcomings of the camera and the stock that was used in order to capture it. If there was anything that I would say um, brings it down a little bit are those two things. But that's not what I think of when I watch this movie. I first saw Found at a film festival in Madison, Wisconsin, totally unaware of what it was. Uh, my film Hole in the Wall was screening at the same festival later in the day. And um, I sat around and watched movies all day. And this movie came on. And at first... It is basically a drama about this this boy who has found out that his brother keeps severed heads in a bowling bag <laughs> in his closet and that um, he's wondering why this is happening and, and kind of scared about what's going to happen once people find out that his brother is essentially a serial killer. But it's not sensationalized for a good whole section like front half of that film it's almost a just a coming of age drama and then there's a point in the movie where um that that child actor the main character of this film goes to a video store and starts looking at videos to take home to watch with his buddy that connected with me on such a subconscious level um because i had been that kid yeah i had been there and that's who I was growing yep. up. I, I <laughs> made the comic sad. books, yeah. I was a comic book maker yeah. and had the lonely friend who was lonely like me. Yeah, it resonated deeply. Yeah, and because the kids, exactly, the, the kids, his buddy wants to make comic books. They make comic books, and through his brother, he's becoming a horror fan because of all, because when you walk into his brother, who's the serial killer, walk into his room, he has 
all of these posters of all these movies. He has all these VHS tapes that he doesn't necessarily get to watch because his brother doesn't want to be that influence on him, but at the same time kind of does. Mm-hmm. He starts exploring these avenues, and then he rents this movie called – or gets this movie from his brother called Headless. Yeah. <laughs> That changes everything. And when I was sitting in that theater, when I first saw this movie, um, I was pretty sure what I was going to experience through the runtime of this movie. And then when we go to the section where the two boys are about to pop in headless and they start watching it and it pops out of that movie into this other movie, which to put it mildly is fucking disgusting. It, it, like ripped my eyeballs out. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> like I was ne- not expecting yeah, that. Yeah, it's the exp- uh, it's the extreme horror film we wouldn't put on this show. It, well, let's not talk about the fact that they went on to make I know. Headless I know. its own film which is quite unfortunate at least in my mind. I I really think it worked extremely well as it was within this film, but that's neither here nor there. But that at that point the film completely changes into something far different than I was expecting it to. And thematically starts again, rounding back to is the horror that we sit and consume as fans of this genre, which most normal people or neuters, as I'll keep (laughs) saying, um, tell us is psychologically damaging and why when kids go nuts, they, they point the finger at what the media is that they're consuming is it because of Marilyn Manson? Is that the reason why for the to speak in the parlance of you know the nineties of when we right. were what or at least when I was growing up, I was in high school and stuff, why Doom and Marilyn Manson and all this other crap, why people were doing bad things as opposed to the fractured and broken homes that they were growing up in. Um this movie starts speaking to that directly. Yes. And that's what Ultimately, when the film was done and you get this orgiastic, gore-filled finale, I walked away shaken from this movie. And that's I, – I don't want to speak in hyperbole about, you know, <laughs> what – how good this movie is and, and try and understate anything. This is legitimately what I felt like. I got up with uh, the lead actor of my film Hole in the Wall, Greg Johnson. We sat next to each other. We got up. Went outside. I don't smoke. He had a cigarette. And we started talking about this film. And we could not stop talking about this film almost for the rest of the night. It was, it's just one of those movies that if you allow yourself to look past the shortcomings, it is a deeply affecting movie that is relatable to every single last horror fan. Yeah. Out there. I actually think that it could only have been made by an independent filmmaker who had about $8,000 to do it because it has a bravery that would get edited out from a movie that was larger. And you spoke right to many of the things that I think make it feel very real, which helps make the performances feel real, the love between the brothers, because it openly addresses that the psycho killer and the brother <laughs> watch the same kind of movies. They don't pretend that on, uh, that only you know well-adjusted people watch horror films, but not just it happens through osmosis. Yeah, that's I mean that's yeah families are parasitic in that way. Is that because of the environment you're surrounded in? you start to gain the attributes of those around yeah. you. It really, that's just how it happens. And it breaks down that delineation that would normally be in a film where you have the troubled serial killer <laughs> brother who has a bowling ball uh, bag full of heads and the brother who's wonder years innocent. They don't do yeah. that, which is so smart and so real. They allow him the pain of being a loner. They allow him the rage of being a loner. They allow him the desire for the street justice that his brother talks about. When his brother says there's only two, do you want to be the kid that gets picked on or do you want to be the kid that gets into trouble? Basically, those are your two choices is what the brother is saying. He's so lonely, painfully alone. He loses his only friend. He's 
picked on every day. He's so alone and lost that he only loves what's left of his brother. He even knows that this is someone who's wearing the skin of his brother. I'm so sad that there's two Steves. It could be anything. In this movie, it's a serial killer, but it could be a horrible drug addiction. It could be anything. But it also brings in father's semi-casual racism and the brother's full-out blown racism, which is where he goes with with his uh, his serial killing, which normally would be sidestepped. You wouldn't want to pollute and make things dirty in that way. You would have him just really hungry for heads or whatever. Uh, that made it feel very real, made it feel very rural, put it right in people's homes. These felt like real legitimate family members. The way that the father talked was how my father talked. You know, I I yep. knew this family. I knew this area. I love that there is this entire fight sequence that happens at a church gathering where everyone's in this certain level of piety. And there is a moment where our lovable kid, the Marty, who is our hero, uh, decides it's time to beat somebody up and he beats up a churchgoer. And it becomes this thing where the priest or the reverend sits with the kid trying to get him to recognize that might doesn't make right. And it's not resolved. And he is sliding into anger as this guy keeps talking to him. And even after going through all of this stuff where normally the kids would finally just shake hands and walk away and never talk to each other, he doesn't. He says, if you do it again, I'll do it to you again. That is so real. That is so pungent for this film that when we get yeah. to this final uh, act, it is desperate and sorrowful, terrifying. The visual image of how our serial killer dresses himself or lack of dresses himself is stunning. Most of those choices that make this movie so rich would be edited out of a larger budgeted film. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I like I tend to gravitate towards underground independent and we're not, I'm not talking about Bloomhouse Independent. I got you. I'm not talking about million dollar movies. I'm talking about these homegrown type of movies like Found. These movies that are made for ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, maybe twenty thousand dollars. These type of movies, because you are not tied to investors that are necessarily dictating what kind of marketable, sellable film that you are creating, you are allowed the opportunity to literally explore everything you want to explore. Yeah. Whether or not that that limits you in distribution, I mean that's I mean that's the choice that you make. I I guess, it, but this film feels like some something that the the collective that put the, that put this together, the writer and director, this was something that they felt and they wanted to show. And I'm so this is why I sit and dig through and champion underground film is because every now and then. Something like this that's not shy about what it wants to show and what it wants to present and how it wants to present those things. I I look for these so much and they when you find it, it's just like this is absolutely why I'm a film fan. Yes. This is what I live for is to see this because it's a new experience. It it resonates on a deeper level all, almost just because of the fact that. It doesn't candy coat anything. Mm -hmm. These people are people. They say things that are politically incorrect. They do things that are completely a mistake. They, I mean, they aren't people that you can pigeonhole. There's so much heart of the filmmakers in it. I'm not saying heart is in yeah. like an uplifting film. There is a heart to this film that you can really feel beating. You watch so many films, especially some of the larger ones and many of the lower budget ones as well, that have a purpose, but not heart. And this movie just feels fleshy and real and messy. It's brave and crazy. And it that final shot, they may have lost a lot of markets over, but that is an unbelievable jaw dropping. I can't believe they actually put that shot in the movie that feels so right and so haunting that it goes right to the top of any list that I do. 
It's just an amazing film. Yep. There's energy. Yes. There's energy to the, the film. And that most homegrown, independent, underground, micro-budget, no-budget movies, the reason why the ones that work work is because of the energy that's happening. Because you can connect and you can feel that energy. And um, more likely than not, and this kind of rounds back to what we were talking about at the top of the show with with art house horror and and cinema that connects with you um, on a very primal level. I am motivated to watch movies that make me feel something as opposed to movies that necessarily tell me a story that I can immediately grasp. My brain works in a way that I like to have I like to have unanswered questions that I can sit and think about after a film that makes me expand maybe what it was that I saw in a way that how does this relate to the world around me and maybe my preconceived notions as to what I feel is right in the world is wrong in the world um is is intrinsic to the human condition i movies that that linger on i i love shitty stupid superficial movies as much as the next person (laughs) i go to the cinema and see hollywood movies all the time i'm not one of these people that are uh, a film snob that only will watch meaningful cinema and I think um, before you were talking about uh, a podcast that just uh, did a show on Lucio Fulci Wrong Reel, mm-hmm. which you've had uh, the guys from that on the podcast before, um, I think, you know, there was a great quote on that show about how um, they they kind of felt sorry for people that couldn't expand their cinematic viewing experience and language beyond what is termed as important cinema. And I I really feel that I really feel sorrow for those people that can't allow themselves to take in everything that cinema offers, even if it's as lowbrow and low budget and kind of homegrown as some of the things that we're talking about, like scrapbook or or found. And as a professional Um, in being involved with all these underground movies like our film Swamp Head, which is about a a floating zombie head that goes around and eats people, (laughs) or or Hole in the Wall, which is an anthology film that really wallows in the depths of uh, John Waters and Herschel Gordon Lewis and Frank Henenlotter and Begotten and all of these types of things. Um, A lot of People that feel that what they're doing is important cinema look at that kind of stuff as porn, mm-hmm. and they always have. Yeah. And and to me, that undermines the fact that I think cinema always, regardless of content that's on the screen, is searching for deeper answers to things. And even as exploitive and, and crass as maybe some of John Waters' stuff is, he is talking about much more. So – to to see films like Found that are that allow themselves the opportunity to sit and showcase the kind of content that they do is it's wonderful. It's wonderful because there there's something that is, that is very real about that and and not sanitized in in something that in life life isn't sanitized. People are fucked up. And unfortunately, most of our of cinema that we watch is just sanitized to the point where it doesn't feel real. I I it, I like watching stuff that is you know fantastic, that is um, otherworldly, and that maybe disconnects me from reality. But sometimes I want to feel that connection. Yeah. I mean, Scott, you, uh, what is it about this kind of stuff that really connects to you? I mean, what is it that 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 you feel connection to that draws you towards these kind of films when in general most of this kind of stuff is looked down upon um by what quote unquote cinephiles yeah i think it's well i i've never been uh, the kind of guy who throws anything away <laughs> i'm a lover of cinema 
I'm not a lover of being known as a lover of cinema. I always want to be surprised. These types of films have a larger frequency of surprising me than many other types of films. And I think in a way there is a love and empathy for imperfection that I just happen to have that I think comes from watching a whole bunch of different types of films. And so the dark and the extreme have a uh, a certain purient thing for me, but there's also this bit that if it's the right kind of film, I'm going to be able to not only be surprised, but be involved in a life or a complexity that I'd never really want to have in my life that I've never seen before. I'm always looking for something that's going to, you can have gallons of blood and bore me stiff. I don't make the distinction. What I look for is being surprised. And I can't think of a better end than what you've been talking about, Derek. Uh, There you have it. That's our exploration into extreme horror films. And I want to thank Derek Harry again for coming on. Derek, thanks so much. And tell everyone how they can find you on the interwebs and what you're up to and where they can find Hole in the Wall. Um, thank you for having me on, Scott. I've I've been a big fan of this podcast for a while now, and I've always been thankful that you've been willing to slum it with me on my <laughs> podcast, Astro Radio Z. You can, If you're a fan of the films that we've been talking about here tonight, but also a fan of trash, cult, exploitation, um, low what normals or neuters would consider lowbrow cinema. You can find my podcast Astro Radio Z at astroradioz.com. It's on Stitcher, YouTube, iTunes, anywhere where you can find Google Play. You anywhere where you can find podcasts, you can find Astro Radio Z. Also, um, as I've kind of alluded to before, uh, I've been involved with the underground film scene for close to about ten years now. Um, I, alongside uh, a major uh, influence on my life for the last 10 years, my bud uh, Jason Paul Collum and I have made a number of uh, documentaries, one uh, for Scream Factory, uh, for their Slumber Party Massacre, uh, Massacre box set. Uh, we did the three-part documentary for that. You can find that through their website. Um, it's all. I think it just came out on Blu-ray a, a couple years ago, so it's it's on there as well. If you you pick up the newer versions of Slumber Party Massacre, our documentaries on there. Also, Screaming in High Heels, which is the story of uh, Linnea Quigley, Brink Stevens, and Michelle Bauer, and how they came to be. You can find that via Broken Glass Pictures. It's on uh, Amazon. Also. Uh, I've made a number of lowbrow films myself. <laughs> um, Swamp Head, it was released by Wild Eye Entertainment. You can find that on Amazon. Also, our um, Wisconsin-based horror anthology, Hole in the Wall, which is kind of a mixture of art house horror, um, exploitation, uh, gore, and um, sometimes kind of art house just it, it's a very surreal strange film some people love it some people hate it but uh i, I it was a, a very life-changing thing for me so if you want to check that movie out it's on amazon prime for free otherwise you can rent it via um amazon and you if you want the dvd which I have a whole stack of them sitting here in my <laughs> office. Uh, you can go on the store envy.com for rabid child films, and you can uh, order a copy of that. And the newest projects that I've been involved with, uh, we just had a movie via um, director Jason Paul Collum. We shot in 2012 called Safe Inside that just came out via the Amazon service. You can get Blu-rays and DVDs, uh, Tempe Entertainment, J.R. Bookwalters, a company just released that film and then i just wrapped up i can i can kind of speak to this now i was uh kind of hushed for a little while about this but we're finally wrapping up uh some of the post on manos returns i was lucky enough to be the editor of that film uh via my my good friend uh, tanya atomic who directed that movie so uh yeah hopefully in the near future the sequel, the 
the much sought after <laughs> sequel to Manos Hands of Fate will be coming out Manos Returns. Awesome. Thanks for giving me all of that. And hey, if you're interested in supporting Hellbent for Horror, go to my website and click the support button. And if you follow me on Twitter, there's a link to my Patreon site on every episode post I do. And I do a lot of episode posts. And we give you free stuff for your support, including your own personal direct play link for the episodes. And with that, thanks for listening, everybody. And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. You can find Hellbent for Horror on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, and other podcast platforms. And H4H has its own app. You can download it from the Google or Amazon store for Android, and the iPhone version is available on the iTunes store. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay hell-bent. Hell-bent.